We'll get started here. I'm uh, extremely pleased to um, give a short introduction to Dr. Lindsay Gleesner. She's a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral researcher, meaning she has her PhD and is in her first research position following that at UC Berkeley in the Space Sciences Laboratory. She had a, her undergraduate degree at San Francisco State University and her PhD at Berkeley, uh, meaning she's a true Bay Area product. She um, uh, performed her dissertation on analysis of solar physics data from uh, RISI, an X-ray spacecraft. She did hardware work developing the FOXY sounding rocket. And we're going to learn today to my um, uh, great pleasure that we're going to learn today about the different types of space-based um, astronomical research projects. Uh, so we heard about a uh, spacecraft, an X-ray spacecraft. We also heard about a sounding rocket. And as you know, we've started our own uh, space program here at Sonoma State University, launching our first CubeSat last year. But this idea of where this kind of hardware and uh, scientific research ba based work and how it can take you into different parts of astronomy is one of the reasons I, I asked Dr. Gleesener to join us today. So let's uh, put our hands together and give a warm welcome to Dr. Gleesener. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to fill up the room. If you can't hear me, please let me know and I'll make an attempt to project. I'm recovering from a little cold last week, so uh, bear with me. I may need a couple water breaks throughout this. Also, if you have questions throughout the talk, feel free to just stop me, raise your hand, and we can ask questions and answer them in the moment as they come up. So the project I'm going to tell you about is called the Focusing Optics X-ray Solar Imager, or the FOXY experiment. This is an experiment that flies on board a sounding rocket. And don't worry, later on I'll tell you what a sounding rocket is. And we had our first flight in late 2012, on November 2nd, 2012. I'm happy to say that that flight was a success. Uh, FOXY was built by the Space Sciences Laboratory at UC Berkeley, with Sam Crocker as the PI. And I worked on this project as a, a graduate student, and I now continue to work on analyzing the data and getting ready for the second flight as a postdoc. Uh, in addition to SSL, we also benefited from two very fortunate collaborations, one with NASA Marshall, which is located in Huntsville, Alabama, and that's where our optics were produced, and the other with a team at JAXA ISS in Japan and they generously donated the x-ray detectors for the experiment. I'm going to start out by giving a short introduction into solar physics and tell you what solar flares are, although I understand that you had a solar talk just a few weeks ago, if, that, if that's right, Life gave a talk. So it could be that some of you have already gotten a good introduction to this subject. And then after that introduction, uh, in the spirit of keeping with the title of this talk, which is what physicists do, I'm going to center very much on hardware and instruments and tell you how we built the instrument, what options we had available to us, and I'll show you some footage from our first flight. Uh, results and plans will be if we have time for those things. So to start out with, let's talk a little bit about the sun. The sun is a star. And it's one that's nearby enough that we had better learn to live with it or learn how to live nearby it. Uh, the sun happens to be a very dynamic star. And it's constantly spitting out radiation at us in the form of <coughs> photons across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. That means everything from radios all the way up to gamma rays. And this radiation can be continuous in the example of the steady state solar wind, which is always hitting us or it can be eruptive and impulsive. As an example, a bright solar flare or a big explosion that happens on the sun that spits out a whole lot of radiation at us in a short amount of time. And when that happens, that radiation can slam into the Earth's magnetic field and cause geomagnetic storms here on Earth. So it's in our best interests if we try to understand the processes at work here. Uh, as technology has evolved, we've gotten better and better at characterizing this radiation, but we still don't really understand 
where it comes from, how the particles are accelerated, what instigates these explosions in the first place. In fact, we can't always really agree on what to call them even. So here are a few terms that get thrown around a lot. When we say a solar flare, we're usually talking about a very impulsive burst of radiation. And this is a huge amount of energy. The sun is by far the most powerful particle accelerator in the entire solar system. And when I say impulsive, that means that this radiation happens very quickly. We're talking about on the scale of minutes to hours. So that's one thing that can happen. Another thing is a coronal mass ejection. And this, as you can kind of tell from the name, is when a whole lot of mass or plasma actually gets ejected from the sun. And it's these that can run into the Earth's magnetic field, depending on which direction the material is ejected at, and cause geomagnetic storms. Now, as we've gotten to know more and more about these, we have come to realize that these two phenomena often happen together. And in fact, they tend to be so linked that we now tend to think of them as two different manifestations of a larger, more generic phenomena that we'll simply call a solar eruptive event. So before I talk about how flares happen, I first want to show you a, a few layers of the solar atmosphere that's up here. I'm going to ignore everything that happens inside the sun, and that's not because it's not important for understanding solar flares. It certainly is, but it's just not relevant for the purposes of this talk. So instead, I'll start with the photosphere, which is what we usually think of as the surface of the sun. It's the place where the photons that you can see with your eyes come from. And the temperature there is about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. As we go up from the photosphere, we get to the chromosphere. The temperature goes down a little bit till it reaches a minimum. And then it goes up very, very steeply as we continue to go up into the solar corona. The solar corona is the outermost layer of the solar atmosphere. It's characterized by a very low density. It has a high magnetic field, and it has an extraordinarily high temperature. We're talking about perhaps one to two million degrees, even in quiet times, meaning when no flares are going on. And then when you do have flares, the temperature of the corona can get up to 10 million, 20 million, maybe as much as 50 or 100 million degrees. And this is something that is pretty unusual. You wouldn't expect that a cooler exterior of the sun is surrounded by something much hotter than that. So the source of that energy is one of the mysteries that we will try to figure out using technology like I'm going to show you today. OK, so it turns out that the corona is very important in solar flares. And this little cartoon over here is meant to show you why. This is kind of like a, a side view of a solar flare. So you have the solar surface here, the photosphere and the chromosphere. And then everything above that is the corona. These lines are meant to give you an idea of how the configuration of the magnetic fields might look. And it's generally agreed upon that before a solar flare, the energy is stored in these magnetic fields. Probably the thing that kicks off a flare is magnetic reconnection, which is a very sudden reconfiguration of the magnetic field into a lower energy state. Uh, that's kind of shown here by these field lines that are crossing. Uh, you'll recall from your e &M class that you can't actually have that field lines that cross. But this is meant to show that in this area, there must be some disconnect. And it's the location where the magnetic field reconfigures. Uh, because it's going into a lower energy state, that means that the difference between the initial energy and later energy is available to go into things like energetic particles. OK, so we think that the magnetic fields are involved. We think that reconnection or this reconfiguration is involved, but we still don't know what it is that releases so much radiation so quickly and accelerates particles to the very high energies that we observed. And by high energies, I'm talking about for electrons, something like on the order of mega electron volts. And for ions, it can be on the scale of giga electron volts. And where does this probably happen? The acceleration must happen fairly close to this reconnection point. And then where do the electrons and ions go after that? Well, if they're ejected this way, then they might be able to escape the whole thing and get out into interplanetary space. And depending on which way those are directed, we might be able to detect those in situ using, for example, spacecraft in low Earth orbit 
or somewhere else in the solar system. It doesn't need to be at Earth. So sometimes we're actually able to measure those excited particles in situ. Um, on the other hand, if particles are ejected from the acceleration site this way, they might uh, kind of enter this loop, bounce around in here for a while, but eventually they're going to kind of make their way down to the base of the loop where the field hits the solar surface. And here the density is so high that the energetic electrons and ions very quickly lose essentially all of their energy and thermalize. Uh, so that means that radiation at these points tends to be very bright. <coughs> And speaking of radiation, here are just a, a few of the tools that we can use in order to try and characterize this picture. Uh, we can have non-thermal radiation that very often takes the form of x-rays that I'm going to tell you about, and also microwaves. We can have a variety of thermal radiation. This is really something that is emitted across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, although the sources of the radiation are different. Uh, as I mentioned, we can sometimes detect the particles themselves if they're able to escape all of this. We can see gamma rays from nuclear interaction. We can look at the way the magnetic field itself is changing. And we can even look in the solar interior and look for these things called sunquakes, which are essentially waves that are excited by solar flares and bounce around the sun. Of course, we can't really see inside the sun, but every time those waves kind of excite something on the surface, we can see something like a ripple. So there's a lot of ways we can look at flares, but what you might notice is that a lot of these methods kind of tell you about how the energy evolves or perhaps where the energy ends up in a flare, but very few of them tell you about the accelerated particles themselves, except for this first one, which is non-thermal radiation. And by non-thermal radiation, I mean radiation from particles that have an accelerated distribution, so not just a thermal distribution. Okay, so that means that we want to investigate that if we want to figure out some of these questions about how particles are accelerated and where they're accelerated. And for that, we're going to use x-rays. I'll tell you why on the next slide. Uh, but before I move on, because people throw these terms around a lot, I just want to tell you what I mean by x-rays. Um, I'm going to refer to anything below about a few kiloelectron volts as soft x-rays and anything above that as hard x-rays. This might be somewhat different from the way that another astronomer might use these terms, depending on the subject. Okay, so why x-rays? Well, if you have charged particles like electrons traveling through some sort of ambient plasma that is filled with ions, then occasionally those electrons are going to encounter ions and there's a certain probability that they'll undergo a collision. Uh, what happens then is that the electron kind of continues on its way. It has a lower energy, its path has changed, and we have a photon coming out here. These photons can be across the, the electromagnetic spectrum, but a lot of times the x-rays are the ones that are really interesting to us because that part of the spectrum tends not to be polluted by other sources of emission that could provide a large background for us. The proton, by the way, basically doesn't even care that this took place. It mostly just keeps on doing what it was doing with only a, a little bit more energy absorbed. Uh, so because of this, because these x-rays are emitted by accelerated high energy electrons traveling through ambient plasma, this tends to be a good way to study accelerated electrons in solar flares. But before I show you what we usually see in solar flares, I want to tell you a little bit about the instrument that we often use to observe them. And here's where some of the instrument and hardware work comes in. Uh, so far, the most sensitive hard X-ray instrument that we have looking at the sun is the Ruben Ramadi High Energy Solar Spectroscopic Imager, or the RESI spacecraft. Uh, RESI was launched in 2002 with the stated goal of understanding particle acceleration and explosive energy release in the magnetized plasmas of the sun. And it does this by measuring X-ray images and energy spectra. Uh, the way it creates these images is a little bit unusual. It's not what you would think of as a traditional telescope that uses mirrors and lenses because it's very hard to reflect or refract x-rays. They just tend to kind of go right on through anything you put them in their way or else they get absorbed. So instead, we use an indirect imaging technique that's called rotation modulation collimation. I'll tell you what that is on the next slide. And then also in 
it, paired with this imaging assembly, we have high purity germanium detectors that measure the energy and make energy spectra for us. And RESI can actually measure all the way from soft x-rays up to gamma ray energies. Okay, so as promised, I'll explain to you what rotation modulation collimation is. So instead of using mirrors or lenses, we're going to choose to block the light instead. But we're going to do that very selectively. So here's a detector at the back. And it has two grids in front of it. These grids have slits and slats, and these two have the same spacing. And they're located pretty far apart, about a, a meter and a half. Then we have x-rays entering from the top here. So this is the incoming x-ray flux. And then to top it all off, the whole spacecraft rotates, which means that we're continually changing the angle at which these x-rays are hitting the instrument. Now it's really that, of course, the x-ray source is not moving, it's the instrument that's moving. But for the purposes of this diagram, it tends to be easier to just show the instrument being fixed in space and we'll pretend that the source is moving across it. So over time, as the spacecraft rotates, you can see that sometimes the x-rays are going to be able to make it through both of these sets of grids, in which case we get a high amplitude count rate on our detector. But sometimes the x-rays get blocked by one or the other grid, and then sometimes you have a decrease due to that. So that means that over time, what you collect from your detector is this time modulation curve that kind of looks like this. And the beauty of this technique is that that modulation curve has encoded within it a lot of information about the x-ray source. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't walk through all of these, uh, but this side is basically meant to show that the phase, amplitude, and frequency of this modulation curve depend on source parameters like location, size, brightness, and complexity. Now, of course, it's never the case that we have some really nice modulation curve like this to measure and try to get information about this source. In actuality, it's always a, a superposition of all of these different ones jumbled together in some very complicated curve that looks like this. And then the real challenge, or shall we say art, in this technique is to use mathematics to take this curve and invert it to recapture the source structure. Uh, that's not an easy step to do, and you don't have to do it yourself. We have several algorithms that are implemented in the RESI software already in order to do it, but there are several different methods, and people argue a lot about what is the best method, which one gives us the most true results, which one works in this case versus that case. Uh, so the main point I want to drive home here is that this is, not, this is a powerful but it's a complicated process. And later on, I'm going to show you a, a different method. Yes? Dr. Gleesener, this is a really fun technique to, to do this. Is this um, set of pictures on the side showing you like a, a spin axis with respect to the disk of the sun? I, I was thinking as you were describing this, you, you are almost would be blind to the things that are right. I mean, if you were spinning, depending on how you're spinning. Yes. But if you were spinning, you might be blind because that would be just a background. You're not going to see it change over time and then allow you to do this um, for a reconstruction of, of an image. So uh, and then, and then I looked at the pictures on the right and was thinking perhaps it's that showing how you're looking at one part of the sun and your field of view is all the rest of the sun. And so this allows you to reconstruct a full image of, of the sun. Is, is that what you can do? Yes, both parts of that were correct. So the place where we point the spin axis, we cannot modulate flux from that location because it, it never really changes that much. So you want to make sure that you point the spin axis of your instrument at a part of the sun that is not a particularly interesting one to you because you can't modulate as well near the center of the grids. And in our case, we do not point the spin axis at the center of the sun because there are some interesting things there that we would like to image. Instead, we offset it a little bit so it's a little bit to the south and it just happens to be a little bit on the right hand side when you're looking at the sun. Uh, so we point the spin axis in a place that we don't care so much about and then we are actually able to image everything on the disk. So we can make images that are full sun images you can zoom in on just the part where your flare is located and just analyze a small field of view if you want. 
the instrument is designed to be very versatile. You can choose the field of view, the energy range, the spatial resolution of your image after the fact. And that gives you a great deal of flexibility. It also means that there are a lot of choices that you need to make when you're at this step and you want to get from here to here. <coughs> okay, so using this technique, as I said, uh, this is so far the best, most sensitive, highest resolution instrument that we have always looking at the sun in hard x-rays. And this is what we usually see. Um, so I, I won't talk much about this energy spectrum, but I'll just point out that it's got two halves. One side is a, a thermal distribution. This is emitted by a very hot plasma of about 30 million degrees in this case. And then above that, we have some non-thermal emission. This is x-rays that are emitted by accelerated electrons, and these tend to form on this log-log plot a straight line that we usually call a power law. So this shows you that it's the, the highest energies here that we're really interested in. But then for the rest of this talk, I'll mostly be centering on images, and this is what a typical one looks like. So in the thermal energies, which is red, you tend to see a loop. Here's the solar surface down here. Uh, the background image here is an ultraviolet image. And so as I said, these are thermal x-rays. And then the non-thermal part, this blue line here, you mainly see at the very bottom of the loop where the magnetic field lines meet the solar surface. So just to put this in context, it's really the case that x-rays are showing us where solar flares originate. We're trying to see in x-rays where these accelerated particles come from and ideally how they are accelerated. So just to bring back this cartoon one more time for comparison, uh, I already told you that in x-rays we can see this thermal loop. That's this one right here. And then these bright, non-thermal, hard x-ray sources are the places where the electrons are reaching the solar surface. As I said, the density is the there is very high, and those sources tend to be quite bright. But what's going on higher up? I mean, we really want to figure out how these electrons are accelerated, and that's probably going on up here. At least we think so. Um, so why don't we see anything there? And the answer, or the challenge, really, is that the density up here in the corona is very low in comparison with the solar surface. And that means that all of our x-rays that emanate from the corona are very faint. So we need to be able to measure very faint sources. We do occasionally see an x-ray source up here, but it's definitely the exception rather than the rule. Uh, so I'll sum all of that up with a couple observational challenges uh, this is what we really need in an instrument that's going to be looking at x-rays from the sun. Uh, one quality that we require is that we need a high sensitivity. And what this means is that we need the ability to see very faint sources. Another thing we need is a, a large imaging dynamic range. What that means in this context is that we need to be able to measure these faint sources in the presence of much brighter ones because we have such a contrast in density between the corona and the photosphere. And unfortunately, RESI and this rotation modulation procedure isn't really the best way to do this. If you want really high sensitivity, well, in using a technique like this, you're putting grids in front of your detectors, so you're already throwing away a lot of your photons because you're selectively blocking them. It's also the case that you tend to have to use very large detectors in order to do this. And the larger de the detector, the more counts you'll collect that are not from the sun. They'll be from other ambient sources. So this gives you a high background and limits your sensitivity. And there's a, a few other reasons I won't go into here why this technique is not really the most ideal one. So we'd like to have something else. And as you can probably guess, the rest of the talk is going to be about that something else. Uh, now, you may have been wondering a few slides ago when I said that we use this indirect technique, why don't we try to do something more direct? I mean, I did say that it's difficult to reflect or refract x-rays, but it can be done under the right circumstances. And what you need in order to reflect x-rays is a very small angle of incidence. Here we're talking about probably less than about half a degree in order to reflect x-rays in the energy range of interest to us, which is soft to hard x-rays. In the 1950s, a, a scientist came up with a, a way to do it, 
and this is the relevant diagram over here. So there are two mirrors. These look like just straight lines, but they're actually not. There's some curvature to them. This one's a parabola, and this one is a hyperbola. And the incoming x-rays enter the instrument from over here. They reflect twice, once off this mirror and then off this one, and then they focus at a point some meters away. Now, the beauty of this technique is that you don't have to just make one mirror and one mirror like this. You can construct these to be complete revolutions. There's half a revolution shown here, and looks like another half of a re revolution shown up here, which is just another diagram of the same thing. And so if you make these in revolutions, and nest mirrors of different sizes together, then you can build up a lot more collecting area because you'll be able to reflect a lot more photons. So once you've done that, you gain some automatic bonuses. You're focusing the photons down to a very small detector. That means that your background will be significantly reduced and your sensitivity or ability to measure faint sources will be higher. And then it also turns out that these types of direct focusing optics tend to have a, a nice narrow point spread function. And we'll talk later about what a point spread function is and why that's desired. And I should point out here that this has really been the standard way of doing things in soft x-rays for a long time. Uh, so below a few keV, this is the standard approach. And these are a couple of the, the spacecraft observ observatories that have done it. Uh, Chandra and XMM Newton, although there have been a lot of other ones as well. But it's only in the last oh, 10 to 15 years that technology has progressed to the point at which we could do this for hard x-rays as well. Uh, there are a few projects that have attempted this. The most illustrious of these projects is the New Star spacecraft. Um, New Star is an astrophysics hard x-ray observatory that was launched two years ago. And ever since then, it has been making really nice high, sensitive, high sensitivity observations of astrophysical sources like active galactic nuclei and supernova remnants. Uh, but of these, FOXY is the first instrument to attempt to do this for solar physics. Okay, now before I get too involved in FOXY, which is my favorite subject, I want to talk a little bit about the different platforms that are available in order to try to do something like this. So now I've t basically told you what it is that we want to observe. The next question is, from where can you observe these things? So where can we do this observation? Can I do it in this room? Can I do it on that mountain over there? Do I need to get all the way to space to do it? Do I need to go to the moon? And the answer, of course, depends on what it is that you want to study in astronomy. Uh, so this diagram shows you the electromagnetic spectrum on the top. We've got radio waves over here, all the way up to the highest energy gamma rays over here. And then on this axis, we have altitude. So this diagram is showing you absorption in Earth's atmosphere. And you see, it varies a lot. We've got a couple of what we call windows, for example, in the, the radio regime. You can measure radio waves from the ground, so you could perhaps put your telescope on the top of a mountain at Mauna Kea or something like that. And then, of course, there's another window at optical wavelengths. So this, again, you can build an observatory that is going to measure visible light and m make your measurements from the ground and ignore all of this kerfuffle about needing to get all the way to space. Okay, what about the different parts of the, the spectrum? If you've got gamma rays, it looks like they will penetrate somewhat far down into the atmosphere. So this is about 25 kilometers here. So if you can get above that, then you can observe gamma rays. You might be able to do that from, say, a high altitude balloon. But in the X-ray range that we're interested in, which is kind of like the, the lower energy X-rays here, well, someday higher energies too, but so far lower, uh, these do not penetrate so far. We're looking at about a hundred kilometers here. And that means that in order to measure these, you actually do need to get to space. There's no edge of space, but what we often use as a rule of thumb is around a hundred kilometers or so. So we can't measure this one from the ground. We're going to need to get into space. And of course, if you asked any astronomer which of these they really want, they would say, give me this one. Please give me a large, expensive, heavy spacecraft that can observe for the next decade or two. And that's certainly what I would like. 
So since I want that, I can go to NASA and I can say, can I please have $500 million? And what do you think they're going to say? <laughs> no, most likely. <laughs> but on a better day, they might say something like, well, if you want that much money, how do you know that this instrument is going to work? Show me that this instrument is ready. Show me that you have a high technology readiness level, or TRL. It's NASA, so everything gets acronyms. So I'm then going to have to go and take every part of my instrument and test it until I have a really high TRL that I can take to NASA and say, give me $500 million. So how can we do this? Well, some of it can be done here in the lab, on the ground. We can't get solar x-rays on the ground, but we have other sources of x-rays. So I could try and test some things in my laboratory here on campus on a bench. And to really test it, we're going to try to mimic a space-like environment to the extent that we can. So we'll put it in a vacuum chamber. We'll subject it to the temperature extremes that it might see in space. We'll throw a lot of radiation at it and see how well it holds up after a lot of radiation dose. Um, so that's all well and done, and we can do that, but eventually we need to put this in space and measure some solar x-rays in order to really increase our TRL. So here's a few of the ways we can choose to do that. Uh, one of the methods is sounding rockets. As you saw in the previous slide, uh, these can actually fly into space. A rocket like we're using can get up to about 300 kilometers, or maybe a little bit higher. Uh, the downside of this one is that this does not go into orbit. It just is launched essentially almost straight up and then comes back down almost in the same place where you launched it. So all you really get in terms of observation is about five or ten minutes. So that's kind of a downer. Um, if you can use a, a high altitude balloon instead, then your observation time is greatly increased. Uh, with a flight from a facility in the United States, for example, you could probably observe for about a day on a balloon. If you take your balloon to Antarctica and can get a high pressure balloon, then maybe you can observe for a month or a few months if you're really lucky. Um, so that's a great advantage in terms of observation time, but you're limited to an altitude of about 40 kilometers. So for us, for x-rays, that's just not going to get work. We need to get to space where a balloon is obviously not going to work. Uh, but just recently, there's another venue that you can use, another platform you can use for your observations, and this is one that Sonoma State has some experience in already. You can launch a, a nanosatellite or a CubeSat. So this is something that is actually a spacecraft. It gets into orbit, uh, often low Earth orbit, but who knows in the future, maybe something higher, maybe something that is not even limited to the Earth itself. And uh, these projects could typically fly for about one to two years or so. That's what they're rated to. But maybe they can go longer than that, and probably in the future they'll be able to. Uh, so those are, are two, two good points in favor of doing nanosatellites. Uh, but of course, there's a downside. That means you have to get your instrument into something that's about this big, or maybe this big, depending on the nanosatellite. And unfortunately for these focusing hard x-ray optics that require meter focal lengths or even larger, that's just not going to work. Unless we could do something very fancy with formation flying of a few, but other than that, we probably can't go this route. So from this list for hard x-rays, we're basically limited to this one up here. Okay, so that's the plan. We're going to develop our technology, develop our experiment aboard sounding rockets, and then someday when we have everything very well tested and we can show that things work well in space, we have a high TRL, and then we'll go back to NASA and say, I'm ready for that $500 million, please. Uh, here's one more slide on what the rockets do and where they go. Uh, so here we have a, a rocket launching. Uh, this is a pretty typical kind, or actually, sorry, this rocket only has one or two stages that's similar to what we'll use. And then once it gets into space, it's just the payload left. That payload can reorient itself to point at whatever it is you want to point at. Uh, like I said, above this point, we'll probably get something like five to ten minutes observation time. And then it comes back down, a parachute opens, and hopefully, if all goes well, it has a very soft landing out in the desert, and you're able to take it and recover it and fly it again. Uh, one more view of that 
in comparison with the altitude of some other types of instruments. Uh, our rocket isn't on here, but it's closest to this one right here. We go up to about this altitude. And you can see where balloons are. They're much lower than that. But we're not as high as, for example, the ISS, which is at about 450 kilometers. OK, um, so I think it's now time to talk a little bit about FOXY. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, FOXY stands for the Focusing Optics X-ray Solar Imager. And as I also mentioned at the beginning, we had our first flight in November of 2012. So that was just about two years ago from now. And we were funded under the Low Cost Access to Space program from NASA. Uh, this is one of the funding elements that often funds, well, all the things on the previous slide, the rockets, the balloons, and sometimes the CubeSats. Uh, we had two goals. The first is a technological one, and this is the, really the main, the main reason that we're flying. And this is to demonstrate that our focusing hard X-ray optics work well in space and are useful for measuring hard X-rays from the sun. But we also have a scientific goal. I didn't mention earlier that these low-cost access to space projects are good not only for getting your TRL up, your technological readiness level, but you can also do quite a bit of science from them. Now, one needs to plan appropriately, and if you only have five to ten minutes of observing, well, the chances that you're going to, to get a big solar flare in that time are just not that high. And so for this flight, we did not plan on trying to measure x-rays from solar flares, although we would certainly like to do that someday. Instead, we said that our scientific goal would be for looking for very faint x-rays from the quiet part of the sun. That's the part of the sun that's not flaring. There are theories that there should be x-rays all over the sun, and if they are there, it could mean that there are accelerated electrons, and also perhaps that reconnection is going on all over the sun all of the time. So we said that's what we'll study for this first flight. Uh, here are a few photographs of the, the hardware that goes into FOXY. Uh, so the technological heart of the project is really our hard X-ray focusing optics. These were produced at NASA Marshall in Huntsville, Alabama by a group that is headed by Brian Ramsey. And here's a photograph so you can see what they look like. I know it just looks like each of these is a, a thin cylinder, but you'll have to take my word for it that there actually is a very careful and very expensive shape figured into each of these. Uh, one half has the parabola and the other half has the hyperbola. These are also very thin. These are about a quarter of a millimeter thick. And then you can see that we have shells of different diameters. So you would then take all of these and nest them together and then you get something like this. So this is an edge-on view of the whole thing. Uh, this one has seven shells inside it. And here you can see a, a close-up of the clips that hold those seven shells. So this also has to be done in a very careful manner because, as I said, these are only a quarter of a millimeter thick, and so they can be quite fragile. Um, I'll mention some of the figures of merit of our instrument, though I'll skip through some of them. And one of them I want to talk about is the full width at half maximum of the point spread function, which is here. Uh, first, let me tell you what a point spread function is. So let's say that we have a, a solar source or some astrophysical source that is just x-rays emanating from a point. Now, if you could build an ideal instrument, that would mean that on your detector, you would also measure just an infinitely small point, or perhaps a, a point that is as small as you can measure on your CCD camera or something like that. But, of course, our instruments are not ideal. There's some roughness to them. There's some misalignments to them. Nothing is perfect. There are diffraction limits. And so what we actually end up with for a point source is some sort of often Gaussian shape that has some width to it. So we'll often talk about the full width half max, which is the width right about here, actually. I guess it's right here. And the narrower you can make this point spread function, or the smaller you can make the full width half max, the better your instrument. In our case, we can get a full width half max of about five arc seconds. And for our case, that is very good for being able to separate the various parts of solar flares. So we'll actually be able to see the bright foot points separated and a coronal source up above that. 
Okay, it's all good to focus and reflect the x-rays, but you also need a way to measure them. Yes? Uh, how does that fall with our maximum compared to the other telescopes like Charger and XMM and mentioned on the previous slides? Uh, good question. Both of those have a spatial resolution, or angular resolution, that is far superior to ours. However, they are also at lower energies. Uh, here we're talking about perhaps 4 to 15 keV, and so far the, the five arc seconds that I mentioned here is probably the best that has been done with focusing optics in that energy range. Uh, we do hope to improve that even more as well. I think technological developments for soft x-ray optics have gotten to the point where people are predicting sub arc second resolution soon. Okay, so we are reflecting the x-rays, but you also need a way to measure them. And so to do that, you have to put some sort of x-ray detector, x-ray camera, x-ray sensor, all of those are used interchangeably, on the other side of your payload. And so in our case, we use detectors that are called double-sided silicon strip detectors. Uh, these were donated by a group in, in Japan led by Tadayuki Takahashi, uh, which is the same group that is working on instruments for the Astro H spacecraft, a uh, Japanese spacecraft that's set to launch next year. And so they actually donated these detectors to us, for which we are very grateful. Uh, this diagram shows you how this type of detector works. You have a bulk piece of silicon, which is this, <laughs> and then you implant strips onto it on either side. You make it so that the strips on this side are orthogonal to the strips on this side. And that way when you have a photon coming in and interacting right here, you'll have charge carriers moving up and down from that point. So that means if you read out both sides of the detector, then you'll get two-dimensional information on where the photon interacted within the detector. That means you can make an image. Uh, here's a photograph of one of the detectors here. I don't know if you can see it from there, but you can actually make out the strips. They're very fine. They're just 75 microns apart. Uh, and this gives you an idea of the scale of the whole thing next to this pencil. Uh, there's one of our detector boards with all of the readout electronics on it, and the detector is the shiny part in the middle here. We have some readout ASICs on the side that capture the signals and measure them. <coughs> So of course we measured these here in the lab before we took them into space. And here are some results from the laboratory calibrations. We used radioactive sources to calibrate these detectors. Uh, these are sources that emit x-rays at energies that you know already. So if I look at this spectrum, which is from americium, I know the energies of these very large peaks. And so I can use that to calibrate the output of my detector against known energies. Uh, that proves that I can make energy spectra, but you also want to show that the detectors can image. So there's some examples of images here. Again, these are from laboratory calibrations. There's no F located on the sun that I know of. And this one up here is actually the first focused hard x-ray image that we made using a high-powered x-ray generator that we put 20 meters away from our instrument. Uh, because 20 meters is not an infinite distance away, instead of getting a nice focused point, we get a ring instead, and this was as expected. Here's how the whole thing looks when you put it together. So we've got the optics over here, there are seven different modules, and then on this side we have the seven silicon detectors with one of these for each optic. So that really means that this whole thing is acting like seven independent telescopes if something were to go wrong with, say, one of these optics, it wouldn't affect the performance of the others. And then um, you'll notice that we're actually using most of our payload here for empty space. Uh, that's in direct contrast to the way a lot of other groups do it. Often you'll see that this entire space would be filled with various instruments. And in this case, that's because we need as long a focal length as possible between our optics and the detectors. If we could make it longer, we would but so far we're restricted to about two meters. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip past some of the measurement capabilities and we'll just move on to some of the figures of merit. Uh, so we're looking at x-rays in the 4 to 15 kV range. The energy resolution, or how well you can resolve different parts of that spectrum, is half a kV. 
and we can see about a quarter of the sun at once. So with this instrument, we cannot do full sun image. We have to actually make choices about where on the sun we want to point the thing. And then we hope that that's the place where flares are going to come out. Okay, so uh, that was probably about four years of work or so in less than 10 slides, but let's move on to Foxy's first flight. Uh, so in October of 2012, we took Foxy out to the desert. We went to the White Sands Missile Range, which is located in New Mexico, about an hour north of El Paso. And NASA operates a launcher here. Uh, White Sands has really been influential in doing sounding rocket experiments essentially since the start of NASA, so there's a lot of history here. Uh, once we were there, we finished the buildup of the instrument. Uh, this is me and a few other scientists working on the electronics surrounding the detectors. Uh, we also integrated our experiment with all the different subsystems in the rocket. So these are the, the parts of the rocket that give us power, communications, and point the thing in the right place. Uh, before we launch it, you also have to perform many tests to make sure that it can withstand, for example, the vibration of a launch. So we put it on a vibration table and make sure that it can hold up to all that shaking. You also measure various properties like the mass, all of the moments of inertia, and the stability. <clears throat> and we had actually been through this process once already at this point. In early 2012, we took the experiment to the desert and we had a launch campaign. But about two weeks before the proposed launch, we had a cooling accident with our liquid nitrogen system and we accidentally supercooled our detectors. Uh, they did not survive that accident, and so we needed to take all of the equipment back to Berkeley, rebuild the detector system, and then take it back and try it again. I'm happy to say that this time things went much more smoothly. Here's what it looks like when we are on the, the launch rail. Uh, so the part of the experiment that I showed you earlier is the part up here. It's enclosed within styrofoam to keep it from heating up too much in the New Mexico sun. And then these are the two rocket motors down here. Uh, up at the top we've got a nose cone that contains the recovery system. Basically that's the parachute that's going to open up later on. And then on November 2nd of 2012, let's see if the sound works, maybe not, we launched. I think this is going to play a, a few times in slow motion so you can see it a, a few times. About 30 seconds after the launch, we sent the command to turn on our detectors. And then once the rocket had reached 150 kilometers of altitude, which is what we need to perform our X-ray observations, the instrument was pointed at the sun and we were taking data from the sun. Uh, the next slide is meant to give you an idea of where on the sun we were pointed. This, these are not FOXY images. The background image here is an ultraviolet image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. But this is meant to give you a feel for where we pointed the instrument. Uh, so we had four different targets. These boxes here show you the targets. And here's one, two, three, and four. So you can see that we covered most of the solar disk at some point. We didn't hit it all. And this included both some regions that were active um, and also some regions that really didn't have much going on. So it's targets like this that we're going to use for looking for things like faint hard x-rays from the quiet sun. In terms of count rates, this time profile gives you an idea of what we observed over time. So at first, for these first three targets, the counts were very low. This is less than 10 counts per second. So to be honest, for the first half of this observation, we were not entirely sure that our instrument was working at all. However, when we moved to this fourth target, the count rate suddenly jumped by over an order of magnitude. And it turned out that this was because there was a solar flare in progress right about here at the time that we pointed at it. So earlier when I told you that in five or ten minutes one cannot possibly hope to measure a solar flare, well, it turns out that I was wrong about that. And I'm very happy that I was wrong about that. Uh, here's a, a short video from our onboard camera. This is a, a GoPro camera that we had essentially put on the outside of the rocket. There's no science in this. This is uh, purely for fun and PR. 
Uh, we reached an apogee of 340 kilometers during the flight, uh, so that was actually higher than our expected 300. And then we got a, a total observation time of six and a half minutes, which we were actually quite pleased with. And then when the rocket payload was on its way back down, after it re-entered the atmosphere, the parachute came up and it landed in the desert. Uh, the next step now is to go and take a couple of helicopters and go and retrieve the payload from its landing site, which is typically, well, in this case, it was about 40 miles away or so. And so this is actually the view from one of the helicopters. You can see the parachute there, and that's the payload having landed. It still hits the ground with a, a decent amount of force, but um, it, I'm happy to say that the recovery went re really well and we essentially recovered the instrument with very little damage, almost ready to just fly again. This is that same onboard camera. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about the, the results because the main point of my talk is to tell you about the process of building this thing, but I do wanna show you at least one pretty picture from our flight because we have some nice ones. As I said, we did not plan on observing a solar flare during this first flight, but since we did, we're going to leverage that to the extent possible. And in particular, this flare was really nice because it was also observed by the RESI spacecraft, which as I told you is the, the current best or the current standard in measuring x-rays from the sun. And so I'll show you some images of the flare that we observed, and I'll start out with the RESI image. So this is the image that was produced using the RESI spacecraft using the indirect imaging technique that I talked about earlier. Uh, this is the edge of the sun. It's not part of the image, it's just something that I put on there so you can see where the sun is. And this is the solar flare out here. Uh, so this one is the only true x-ray source in this image. All of the other blue stuff that you see over here is essentially just imaging noise that comes from doing this Fourier inversion from a time modulation profile into an X-ray source map. So again, this is the only true source. And as I mentioned, there are several ways to try and produce this image. To make this one, we used the one that is considered kind of like the most reliable or most commonly used. So here's the Foxy image of the same field of view and the same source. Again, you see the flare up here in the same location as Resi sees it, but the rest of the field of view is free of all of these imaging noise and artifacts that you see over here. And so this image really drives home the point that you can get a much better imaging dynamic range by using something like direct optics. And I'll also point out that we made this particular image I think just a few days after the flight. Uh, so that tells you that there was not a lot of processing or math that needed to go into making this image. Because it's a direct image, you just read out the signals from your detectors and you put every photon in the pixel it's supposed to be in. Uh, this image was really made as easy as that. Um, I do want to zoom into the image to look at it in a little bit more detail. Uh, so again, I'm going to compare with Resi. This time I have the Foxy image on the left-hand side here. Uh, so this is an image that has had the point spread function deconvolved, and that means there's a, a bit more math that has gone into it than the image I showed you on the previous slide. Again, this is the edge of the sun, and what you're seeing here, you can make out, it looks like a small loop. So this is really showing us the thermal loop that I demonstrated in the cartoon earlier. In the center image here, we have an image that is made using the, the RESI spacecraft. Again, you see the source looking somewhat similar to ours. Uh, actually, this green line right here shows you the FOXY source on top of that for comparison. And once again, you can see the imaging noise and artifacts in the rest of the field of view. So just to keep in mind why we're doing this, imagine that you have this X-ray image of a loop and you want to look at another source that's located right here. With the RESI image, it will be difficult to do that because of this noise. In the FOXY image, if there's another source right here, you'll see it. And then uh, just to show some different possibilities for how RESI images can be produced, we used a, another imaging technique, a forward fitting technique here, to get a RESI source. Now, I don't want you to think that we've just gotten rid of all of these noise 
and artifacts from this image, the truth is that those have just been masked in this image so that you don't see them. And so that way we can compare the source location and structure with the foxy image, which is shown in green here. And you can see that they line up pretty well. It looks like we really are seeing the same source. And so this is an important validation that the structure we see in Foxy is also seen by another instrument. And that shows that the instrument is indeed working well. Uh, we don't have to just compare to x-rays. We can also compare to other wavelengths like ultraviolet wavelengths. Uh, so there's an example of that here. These background images in blue are from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. These are extreme ultraviolet images that in this case are taken at 131 angstroms. Uh, this instrument is called the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, so looking just at the background for a moment, you can see these bright loops. You can see a lot more structure in the ultraviolet images. Their resolution is much better than ours, and they're also brighter. And then the red contours show you the foxy image for comparison. It's a little bit easier to line up these two if we take the ultraviolet image and we subtract an image from before the flare started. So that way we're just isolating the emission that happened at the time that Foxy was observing it. And in that case, you get this. So this is now a, a subtracted image where you essentially just see the hot part of the loop here. And you can see that the Foxy source lines up with that fairly well. So that's another important validation of Foxy's imaging. <clears throat> okay, I think in the interest of time to leave time for questions, I'm going to skip past the spectral information. And instead, I'd like to, to say a bit more about what it is that we'd like to do with Foxy in the future. So we had our first flight, um, but we're not planning on ending there. I told you that we recovered the instrument in good health, essentially ready to fly again. Uh, there were a few things here and there. One of the optics was dislodged a little bit during the flight, so we had to fix that problem. And we also wanted to do some upgrades to the instrument before we flew it again. So we have performed some upgrades to both the optics and the detector system that will allow the instrument to operate even better than it did the first time. And although the first flight was a success, we did certainly find several things that we didn't do right. So we are fixing all of those for the second flight. And actually the second flight is currently scheduled for December 9th of this year. So at the moment we're in the process of building up the payload and getting it ready for its next launch campaign. So uh, the Foxy team will be spending a lot more time in the desert like you saw earlier. And then of course let's keep in mind why we want to do this in terms of a, a long view. Really the point of the FOXY rocket experiment program is to prepare this technology for someday using a similar type of technology aboard a spacecraft. And if we had a spacecraft, uh, what with the longer focal length that one could do, what with the greater weight that you would have available, and what with the, the larger instrument with more mirrors that you could build, you could build a much more impressive instrument that could focus perhaps up to 80 or 90 kV. This would be very similar to the New Star X-ray Observatory. And there's a, a whole rich zoo of solar phenomena we could look at. We could look for X-rays from the quiet part of the sun. Are there really reconnection events happening all over the sun all the time? If there are, then that might help to explain why the solar corona is so much hotter than the surface of the sun. So that's one mystery we could try to explore. And as I mentioned earlier, we could try to explore partic particle acceleration in solar flares and actually nail down how these are happening. We could also look for faint hard X-rays from coronal mass ejections. These are the huge ejections that spit a whole lot of stuff out at the Earth and cause geomagnetic storms. So there are a lot of things that we could look at. Okay, so I want to wrap up with just a, a few thoughts. We often tend to think that astronomical observatories need to be something that's based on the ground, like the observatories at Mauna Kea, or in space, like the, the Hubble spacecraft and the dozens of other instruments that NASA operates aboard spacecraft. But there's actually quite a bit in between. There are a lot of other venues from which one can make observations, and a lot of these are, are what are termed low-cost venues, and by low-cost here we're talking on the scale of a few million dollars, which is low-cost. 
Um, and so even though these are low-cost observatories, there's quite a bit of science that can be done from them. And that includes not only rockets, but also the high-altitude balloons that I mentioned earlier. Depending on what you're observing, you might be able to make those observations from an airplane, for example. Or nowadays, one could try to make observations from a nanosatellite or CubeSat, like Sonoma State is doing. Uh, one of the last points I wanted to make is that these low-cost projects are used not only to up your TRL and get your technology ready for a future experiment, they're also used to develop people as well. And that means that these projects are very dependent on the work of graduate students and postdocs, uh, for example. A lot of young scientists are involved in this work. Uh, so in the case of Foxy, I was a graduate student on the project, and that meant I got to have my hands in a lot of the instrument, quite literally in a lot of the instrument. And that's an opportunity that one would not necessarily get if you're working on an instrument for a spacecraft that is operating on a very long timeline and has to adhere to uh, much more stringent quality control standards. So these are used both to develop technology for future missions and also to develop young scientists who will later go on to work on space-based or ground-based observatory hardware. Okay, in terms of the actual project, I'm pleased to say that in our first flight, we produced the first focused image of the sun above 5 keV. Uh, so we had a, a very successful flight despite having only six and a half minutes to look at the sun. And really what we want to say with this first flight is that this really means that focusing hard X-ray optics are now a viable technique for looking at X-rays from solar flares and that this technology is really ready to go. So let's build a spacecraft next. Okay, that's all. Wonderful, Dr. Gleesner. We have um, the room to 515. We'd like to take questions. Great. Some of our uh, students have other class sessions that they have to go to. If we could take um, two minutes for anyone who has to leave before the questions, to leave very quietly. Um, and then the rest of us will have a nice discussion section till 615. If anyone still who's adjourning with the sign-in, please okay. do so outside and leave it there. I'll come and get it. Please do this quietly and quickly. Thank you. Okay, so let's, um, let's do questions. Yes? Um, you said um, you asked for like, um, second to last, but focusing on the now viable method for hard X-ray, what, what was preventing it from being used before? Uh. Really the, the difficulty, the reason it took longer to develop focusing optics for hard x-rays than for soft x-rays is because the higher in energy you go, the more difficult it is to reflect the photons. Another way to say that is that the, the reflectivity coefficient becomes very small. And that means you have a lot less error allotted to you in terms of how rough the mirror can be how exact the figure has to hit the shape of the parabola and the hyperbola that we mentioned earlier. At lower energies, one could allow for a little more roughness and you'd still get a decent focused flux, but at high energies, that doesn't work. Um, our mirrors need to be smoothed to about an amplitude of a few angstroms. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, so you obviously have this flare pop up the exact right time view. Well, we planned that. that. Sorry? We planned that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, okay. we didn't. Well, when you had a flare that you planned for, uh, you said that the objective might be to study whether there was a generic amount of X-rays being generated around the sun in a non-flare time. Mm -hmm. So although you had the flare on the side, did you find anything interesting about X-ray generation moment to moment mm -hmm. that you might have been able to get if you hadn't had the flare to study? Yes, good question. So that was actually our goal in this flight, and I didn't talk about that at all. Uh, we did not find a definitive signal from the quiet sun in hard x-rays, and there were two main reasons for that. Uh, one is a problem in our instrument that I, that I did not talk about for sake of time, and that was that we had some of our thermal blanketing move into our optical path and reduce our sensitivity. Uh, so that means that we were not operating with the full sensitivity that we intended to, and that's one of the issues that we are definitely fixing for the second flight. Uh, the second thing that kept us from observing hard x-rays from the quiet sun, if they're there, was the fact that the solar flare was going on. 
Uh, so I talked earlier about how Foxy's point spread function is nice and narrow, which allows us to have good angular resolution. But it's not the case that all of the flux is located in this narrow core. It actually does spread out across the field of view. So that means if you have a, a bright source going on somewhere on the sun, even if it's not the location you're looking at, there's kind of these tails of the, the point spread function that spread out across the rest of the sun. Uh, so we actually do have some counts from the quiet sun, but we believe that those counts are just part of the point spread function okay, from so the flare. The of the PSF are very large compared to the core. Yes, oh. that's right. Yeah. Well, number one, that sounds like AO. <laughs> so I, I know that problem too well. Um, but my question was, do you have non-thermal X-ray photons? I mean, ultimately, I think it's the thing that you had to skip, but you have a flare event. Right, and if you and if you have a, a you know spectrum of this, you could say at what level you think what your rejection limits are for a, for a non-thermal component of the reconnection. So, That's right. We do not have a non-thermal component in this flare. So from this flare, it seems that all of the photons we measured are thermal photons from the loop, and we don't see, for example, a hard X-ray source above that. But you're absolutely right that we could set a sensitivity limit based on that and it's better than the corresponding sensitivity limit for RESI for this particular event. Rick. Uh, it's a question about your financing. You said you applied to NASA for half a billion dollars, and they said they weren't technologically ready. Mm -hmm. So you got ready. Uh, <laughs> but that wasn't free. So mm -hmm. where did that money come from? And order of magnitude, how much is that compared to the half billion? Mm. So it's also from NASA, and uh, just for a little bit of clarification, we have not actually asked NASA for half a billion dollars, but we certainly would like to in the coming years. Um, but our pool of money, the budget for the FOXY project, also came from NASA, but was funded from a, a different element than the program that funds spacecraft. Uh, so this is called the Low Cost Access to Space Program, although that's the heliophysics technology term, I think in astrophysics it maybe is called something else, but some similar terminology. And those projects are rockets, balloons, and sometimes these small nanosatellites that tend to be on the order of a few million dollars. So I can tell you the FOXY-1 budget was two million, roughly. And that qualifies as low cost. Well, it's certainly a lot lower than 500. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, yes. Uh, another question about that reconnection or deconnection event. Mm -hmm. Seems to me like when the flares go, there's a crack or a, a snap, and this is in the UV images. So there's a definite, you know, the little thing sticking out there above the large area of the, uh, the X-rays in mm -hmm. ultraviolet. So you'd almost have to be on a spacecraft, kind of looking for a reasonably long period of time to, you know. Get just that moment in your frame, I would imagine. Yes, that's right. Um, so, in order to see any sort of, uh, let's say, decent sized flare or ejection and to look at things like how the plasma around it responds, you'd pretty much have to be in space already, ready to go. Um, a question that I'm often asked is, could you say, have your rocket ready, and then as soon as you see some indication of a flare, fly it then? And the answer to that is, well, not only would NASA and, and the military probably not let us do that, but it's, it is the unfortunate case that the things we're interested in are the very first things that happen in a flare. So, so far we don't have any warning that a flare is going to happen, although we are certainly interested in trying to look for some sort of warning markers that flares are about to take place. So in order to observe things like you just mentioned, I think you probably need a spacecraft. Oh. Could I do one more about the objects? So those were pure nickel, they weren't gold coated on the inside? They were not gold coated, but they were a nickel co cobalt alloy and they do have an iridium coating. An iridium? Yes. Um, something we could look at in the future in order to get to higher energies is different types of coating and perhaps having uh, what Newstar has, which is multi layers on the optics that could allow you to measure a larger energy range than we could get with just the straight reflectivity of either nickel or iridium. Yes, you had a question? Yeah, scattering, extra scattering from this kind of 
Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, so this kind of goes back to uh, the question that you had asked earlier about you know, what's the technological difficulty in creating these, and that's one of the issues. So if we have a, a mirror that is not exactly smooth or not smooth enough to our standards, then when an x-ray hits it, instead of reflecting at the right angle, it's going to go off at a slightly different angle. So it's going to scatter off the mirror and it's not going to go in the direction that it's intended. So we want to limit that as much as possible in order to get a focused image. But if we do not do if a really, really infinitely good job of limiting that, then it means that the x-ray will end up somewhere else on the detector, and that's one of the things that gives us this very wide wing to the point spread function. But it's like really scattering? Uh, let's see. Not in this context, but you could probably work out the math of the reflectivity starting from that basis. Let's thank our speaker.